I met James at his farmhouse in Pennsylvania. The climate scientist spent 46 years working at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. Now, he directs the program on climate science at Columbia University's Earth Institute. The only way that we're going to solve the climate problem is by making the price of fossil fuels honest. It needs to include its cost to society. And so what we should do is have a gradually rising carbon fee or carbon tax. And that way it would allow alternatives, alternative energies and energy efficiency to compete with uh, the fossil fuels and we could move to clean energies. However, to solve the global problem, we're going to need to work with China. We're the two big emitters. We have the two biggest economies in the world. So what's fundamentally needed is an agreement between the United States and China to have a rising carbon fee. And if we did that, we could make it uh, global or nearly global by having uh, border duties on products from countries that don't have an equivalent carbon fee. And that would encourage them to have their own fee so that they could collect the money themselves rather than have us collect it at the border. Uh, but the problem is that China you, has such a large fraction of its emissions from uh, a large fraction of its energy from fossil fuels. And there, China is not going to uh, put a large fee on carbon if they don't have an alternative to uh, coal for their electricity. And that's why, you know, I have friends and former students in China, and uh, I, I propose that we have a workshop on uh, nuclear power, because that's the one alternative where we could get electricity and, and with no carbon emissions. Uh, but no country wants to use old nuclear technology, because we know ways to make uh, nuclear power in a much better, uh, safer way, which uses more of the energy that's in the nuclear fuel. Uh, but we need to develop this best modern technology. And to do that, the United States and China could effectively cooperate. And it's very unfortunate that we're not working together on this problem. James studied physics and astronomy at the University of Iowa, where he earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees. Since the late 1970s, his research focused on Earth's climate, especially human-made climate change. He's best known for his congressional testimony in the 1980s that helped raise awareness about global warming. Do you think when you were talking to members of Congress then that you'd still be talking about it with a guy like me this many years later? No, because, well, in the 1980s, that was shortly after the ozone experience of several years earlier, in which the governments around the world quickly came to agreements to do something about ozone depletion. And, but that, turns out, was a much easier problem because the gases that caused ozone depletion were coming from basically one source, from uh, the chemical companies, uh, especially Freons or CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that um, when they break down in the stratosphere, they cause ozone depletion. And so that was a simpler problem. Um, and th those chemical companies could make just as much money by with substitute chemicals. So, so uh, given the fact that you know there was success. Um, it's interesting because your, your books are lined up here on the bookcase, and I'll just give the title because to me it's a clarion call for action. The Storms of My Grandchildren, The Truth About the Coming Climate Catastrophe, which that's shocking. 
and our last chance to save humanity. I mean, that is basically like grabbing people and shaking them and saying, you know, get with it. Um, so success there in the 80s, but now why do you think uh, we're, we're still talking about this issue? And with each passing day, it's, it's more critical, isn't it? Yeah, it's because it's a long-term issue. You know, it, our governments, especially democracies with two and four and six year election cycles are not set up to solve 50 to 100 year problems. Um, and it's just, you know, people have other things on their mind on this short term. They have lots of things to worry about so they don't spend their time thinking about 50 years from now. There are ongoing international efforts to cut greenhouse gas emissions before this year's United Nations Climate Summit in Scotland. The U.S. Climate Envoy, John Kerry, has met with global leaders, including those in China, to discuss the issue of cutting emissions. He says Washington is looking at the possibility of introducing a carbon fee on imports from countries who don't tax heavy polluters. Carbon pricing, uh, it, it's interesting. I knew we were going to go there today, and I, I found an article where, the, and I'll quote a little bit from it. It said, Kerry boasted that he has long been a climate change activist. He was present when the esteemed climate scientist James Hansen spoke before Congress in 1989. Um, however, Hansen has been a longtime advocate of carbon pricing and made his position clear to Kerry when Kerry led the U.S. delegation to the 2015 Paris Climate Conference. But Kerry dismissed this. Um, had he listened to you, where might we be today, do you think? Well, I think that the COP meetings, the conferences of the parties, is probably not the place where we're going to get an agreement on a global carbon price. I think it, basically it requires an agreement between the United States and China. Um, and, you know, I heard in the press uh, uh, response to the first telephone call between President Biden and President Xi that they did mention they wanted to work on climate, and they even mentioned carbon tax. So maybe they understand that that's the essential policy that's needed. Because 200 nations setting goals to reduce their emissions, it just doesn't work. We've been doing that for 30 years, and uh, emissions just keep going up. Unless you make the price, the cost, the, the price include the cost to society, we won't solve the problem. Um but you're still up against all those forces that you've been up against, you know, from the get-go. Uh, how do you, how do you change that dynamic, or can you change that dynamic? Well, the dynamic should change as the evidence of the consequences becomes stronger. And finally, we're seeing uh, effects around the world which can be associated with um, the increased greenhouse effect. But it is a hard problem because the most serious things occur on a 50-year time scale. The real, the biggest issue is probably sea level. Uh, we can put in motion the changes in Antarctica especially that will cause eventual sea level rise of many meters. And that would uh, be the end of most of the coastal cities in the world. Uh, and more than half of the large cities in the world are on coastlines. China has a large number of people living near sea level. The United States, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Miami, all of these cities are on, on the coastlines and would be uh, become dysfunctional if we get sea level rise of several meters. But that's, that's the, the time scale of that. Well, that is uh, uncertain, but I argue in our P 
paper, ice melt, sea level rise, and superstorms, that it could be this century, that it would be this century if we stay on business as usual. So, but that's uh, hard for governments to deal with these long-term problems. Is it just too hard? Do, or is that the perception? It's, it's not too hard. Because it just, you know, there are other benefits of clean energies. So it's something we really should do. Uh, and it's, uh, well, <laughs> it's how do we get the governments to actually understand that and move in the right directions. And I think that, I think that in China, that they will move in the right direction, but I don't think they'll move a lot faster. I don't think they will move fast enough if we don't get agreements with the rest of the world. A warming climate can cause seawater to expand and glaciers to melt, both of which can cause a rise in sea level. Without changes, scientists believe the steady rise will mean an end to most of the coastal cities in the world, including Shanghai, Tokyo, and Bangkok. Currently, more than 10% of the world's population lives in coastal cities. out here in this beautiful environment listening to the cicadas and it's so easy to think well everything's fine um, especially when you look at the gorgeous blue skies but when you think about the future I mean we could lose a lot of what we love uh, what are your fears well the big fear is not the surroundings here it's uh, it's way off in Antarctica it's the uh, danger that it will go unstable. In fact, we know it will. We have the, the Earth's history, which shows us how the ice sheets respond as the climate changes. And the problem is it doesn't happen like that, or maybe that's good that it doesn't happen like that. It'd actually be better if the response was quicker because then the politicians would see the consequences. What is actually gonna happen is the time that the big effects will occur will be in our children and grandchildren, and their children's lifetimes. That's uh, the difficulty of this whole problem. It's the delayed response of the system. So it's very hard for a political system to uh, respond to a problem which is several decades in the future got enough going on day to day here without worrying about what's going to happen 50 years from now. That's the problem. In 2020, when the coronavirus pandemic caused major economies around the world to come to a near standstill, greenhouse gas emissions were reduced. Skies over many nations, including parts of China, were cleared. With the reduced economic activity, Greenhouse gas emissions declined by 7% in 2020, but it was only temporary. You know, you think about the pandemic and, and all these lockdowns and people not in their cars and driving around. I mean, did that, did that help us at all? I mean, what, what's your takeaway during this period where so many people were stuck at home and couldn't travel? No, the, the pandemic reduced emissions a few percent uh, globally. Uh, several percent in some countries and less than that in others. But uh, no, as long as uh, fossil fuels are powering our economies and they're about 85% of the energy that we use, then uh, emissions will continue. That's why we have to move to carbon-free energies. What about all the electric vehicles that are now hitting the market? Does that give you some sense of, you know, we're, we're kind of at least thinking about this and trying to move in a different direction? Well, we're, we're trying to move in a different direction, but you really need the economic incentive 
and the economy and the guidance that you get from a carbon price in order to move rapidly. We could, electric vehicles uh, are fine if they're getting their electricity from carbon-free sources, but at the present, that's not the case. So it's a good investment now, but we have to get uh, the price on carbon so we get carbon-free electricity. You were mentioning nuclear energy earlier. There are some countries that lean rather heavily on that. I mean, when you look at the landscape out there, uh, are there countries where you, you think, well, at least they're moving in the right direction? Or I mean, when you look at the global perspective, I know that you, you rightly say the US and China are gonna drive things, they have to work together. But are there countries out there that you think are, are moving in the right direction? Well. The one country that I have high hopes for is China itself, because it is investing in development of nuclear energy, but I think it will not move in a very large way until it has the technology that it's satisfied with. And it's trying several different things, and we should be working together, because uh, we have a lot of uh, innovative uh, uh, things going on in the United States in nuclear, but they're not leading to production of nuclear power plants on a significant scale. That will happen only in the places where it's where energy use is still expanding, like China and India. And China needs to replace a lot of its coal-fired power plants. So there's a, lot, a big need there, and if we would work together, we could move faster, I think, and get a technology which uh, governments would be happy to see expand on a large scale. Fantastic. Well, it was great visiting with you. Uh, uh, very much appreciate spending time with us today. Thank you.